How many of you have your Bibles? Hold them up. All right, we're just about finished with 1 John. In the back of the New Testament, the first epistle of the aged Apostle John. 1 John and chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. I'm going to begin reading in verse 17. 1 John 5, 17. You know that 1 John was written to those who have already received Christ as their personal Savior. They're already on their way to, to heaven. But there are internal evidences that help us to have assurance of our salvation. And in verse 17, John writes by inspiration, All unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. In other words, there, there are sins that are unto death that lead to our death. And there are sins that are not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now the verb tense for sinneth means habitually sin. We know that whosoever is born of God, born again, does not habitually sin. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This, notice, this is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for the Word of God, which is quick, it's alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And thank you, Lord, that you've given us this Scripture tonight for a divine purpose. Help us to understand what it is, Lord. I pray that you will open up our understanding tonight, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. A little girl in Christian school was being disciplined for disobedience. She knew what she had done wrong. And we have always taught that behind every physical and material experience, there is a spiritual battle being waged. How many of you believe that? Yes, behind the physical and material world, there is a spiritual battle battle. There's a warfare going on. And so reminding the little girl of what she had done wrong uh, and her need of forgiveness, the question was asked, what is necessary? What's the very first thing that's necessary in order to have forgiveness of sin? Now what was being driven at was this. Uh, certainly a person ought to recognize their need of forgiveness, right? And they ought to have a, a, a perhaps a, a, a sorrow, a godly sorrow for the sin that's been committed and a, a desire to do better, perhaps repentance, right? These are all things that we would hope for when dealing with young or old alike about the matter of sin. So uh, what is the first thing she was asked? that is absolutely necessary in order to have forgiveness of sin. And she thought for a moment, and she said, You have to sin. You have to sin in order to have forgiveness of sin. And you know what? Although she missed the spirit of what was being asked, she got it technically correct. We know that before sin ever entered this realm, that there was a rebellion in heaven. And it tells us clearly so in Isaiah chapter 14. We know that Lucifer, who was there in the presence of God and was in charge of the music program, according to Ezekiel 28, that he rebelled and he said no fewer than five times, I will, I will. 
He wanted to ascend to higher than God. He led a rebellion and as a result, God cast him and one third of the heavenly host out. And we know that here in our atmosphere, Adam and Eve were made stewards of dressing and keeping and maintaining the Garden of Eden. And in the course of that stewardship, somehow Eve was left alone in the presence of the serpent into whom Lucifer entered and spoke to her and said, Yea, hath God said, questioning the words of God. And that has been the devil's deception from the beginning to introduce doubt about what God says in His Word. And of course, she was led into temptation and she she was deceived and she ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she offered that to Adam, who likewise partook. And the Bible says very clearly, and you say, Preacher, do you believe that old story? I believe every word of the Bible is true. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all mankind, all men, for that all have sinned. We are all sinners by nature. And we are all sinners by By practice, we become old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, and we are responsible before God. So, what do we have to do? What's the very first thing in order to have forgiveness of sin? She was technically correct. We sin, but we need to seek God's forgiveness. And the scripture that we have read tonight says, All. Not some, not most, but all unrighteousness is sin. It tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10 that there is none righteous, no, not one. So among all of those who have ever lived with the exception of our perfect sinless Savior, Jesus Christ, every person is unrighteous. And yet the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 10 that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Part of our Roman road plan of salvation, we saw 212 precious, now 213 precious souls that we know have come to God through the fair ministry. And even though we are not righteous on our own, Jesus Christ has provided the way for us to be righteous, to believe unto righteousness. Now for the sinner who has been saved in 1 John, it's still true that all unrighteousness is sin. And we have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there is a sin not unto death. We have just read about the sin unto death that leads to a a person going to an early grave because they've been warned and warned and we know that whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth. And eventually, if we don't repent of sin, we'll go home to God early. Some of you know someone like this who undoubtedly has sinned and sinned and sinned and ultimately the consequences of their earthly sin has led to an early grave. The Zicks don't speak often, but they did early on in their ministry. They have a grown daughter who is in heaven now, who undoubtedly sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned, did not repent, did not stop, but eventually her abusing her health, her body being the temple of the Holy Ghost, and she did not stop. She ended up going to an earlier grave than she would have. We know that she's in heaven because she trusted Christ. That's a wonderful truth. But wouldn't it be better if we lived longer? We're able to serve God longer. Amen. Brother Beebe often preached a message. He said, chastisement and the sin unto death. The flip side of the doctrine of eternal security. He said the the coin 
on one side says that we are eternally saved, we're secure in Christ. But the other side says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and there is a sin unto death. And then he cites the case of a bus child who had come to God and as a teenager had gone on living in their self-willed way. And even though he is not God, as much as we can know, when that young man was laid to rest as a teenager, there was no doubt in Brother Beebe's conviction that he had committed the sin that had led to his death. There are those sadly, who go that direction. So what is sin? For years, the pastor of the great Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. R.G. Lee, used to preach a message called, What is Sin? The Bible Answers What is Sin. And we can provide this little outline that I'm borrowing tonight for people later on. We'll print it out for you. But sin, number one, is transgression of the law. It is lawlessness. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. It is lawlessness. People who want to push the envelope instead of desiring to be what God would have them to be and as close to Jesus as they can be. Instead, they want to be as lawless as they can be. It's going to bring death. Number two, what is sin? Dr. Lee answers the question, a grievous malady contaminating the whole of man's being. And he uses a couple of scriptures here. Some we're very familiar with. From Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. The contaminating of the whole being of man. Sin does, it doesn't just, isn't just satisfied to, to infect a part of us, but it contaminates the whole being. It's a grievous malady. And in Isaiah chapter 1, I would like to preach through that book sometime. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Isaiah 4, oh, excuse me, 1, 4, and 5. Isaiah is saying of the nation of Israel that the whole head is sick. The whole being is sick. It's a grievous malady. When I look at those that are infected by the malady of sin, I feel bad for them. But I know what it does. I know how it brings down a person, a family, a church, a society, a nation, a people. Number three, what is sin? Dr. Lee answers, an obscuring cloud which hides the face of God's blessing. An obscuring cloud which hides the face of God's blessing. And that's, that's something we can preach, Gabe. Over in Isaiah 59, 59 and verse 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His faith, face from you that He will not hear. When a nation, when a people reject the entreaties of God who loves and gives of Himself, of His own Son, for forgiveness, and they reject that entreaty. It's an obscuring cloud. The Bible tells us that even now, those people that are known as the apple of His eye have a veil over their face, over their eyes now, but it will one day be lifted, and the entire nation is going to turn to Yeshua Messiah, and they're going to believe on Him in a day, the Scripture says. Number four, Dr. Lee says that sin is a binding cord which holds man in its power. A binding cord that holds man in its power. It's constricting. It's restricting. Proverbs 5.22. Proverbs 5.22. And on and on the outline goes. It says... Number five, that sin is a tyrannical owner who embitters the lives of his slaves. A tyrannical owner that embitters the lives of his slaves. Nehemiah 9, 37. A disturber of rest which causes disorder and anxiety. A disturber of rest which causes disorder and anxiety. Psalm 
38.3. And I'm going to close with this. Although there are 14, I'm going to give you seven only. Number seven, a robber of blessing which strips and starves the soul. A robber of blessing which strips and starves the soul. Jeremiah 5.25. There are believers on their way to heaven right now that are living in the lowlands of sin, having been tempted and having succumbed because the old nature is so powerful and so infectious and contaminates so much. And yet, they go on and on without repentance. They go on as slaves. They go on uh, as those that are destitute in a poverty of, of blessing, in a poverty of God's goodness, when they could be on the receiving end of an abundance of blessings. I'm going to eventually preach most or all of these points, but sin is so very serious, and it is an offense to a holy God. The worst part about sin is the estrangement factor. It separates us. And even those that are children of God, it's like children that are out of favor, children that, that are out of that place of blessing and joy. And so we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, does not habitually sin. Why? Because of the sin unto death. If we do not repent of our sin, God brings us into a place of chastisement. If chastisement does not work, then we are going to be pruned off and we're going to have an early grave. And God doesn't do this because He's cruel, but God does this for two reasons. First of all, He doesn't want us to continue down worse into that sin, worse into the consequences, and also He does not want His name and testimony dragged through the dirt of reproach. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself. What does that mean? That means that there is a Holy Spirit guard, a keeper that, that watches and keeps us and keeps on reminding us, keeps on bugging us about our sin. I have known born again believers who have gotten so backslidden that they have said, I wish the Holy Spirit wouldn't bother me anymore. Because it bothers them, it bugs them that they can't go on in their sin and do like they want to. But if you've been bought with a price, guess what? You belong to God. God has every right to us. So that which is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not. What does that mean? Toucheth him not. That means that Satan does not have ultimate jurisdiction. Are you with me? Satan doesn't have ultimate jurisdiction. Now, Satan will play with and toy with the believer that is fooling around in sin getting their feet and their ankles and their knees dirty in the filth of sin. And Satan will have fun for a while with that one. But God still loves that one, and God's not going to allow that one to go completely, because whom he loveth he chasteneth. The person who is not saved truly, who plays in sin and doesn't get, cha doesn't get chastened, has never been truly been born again. And so it's a good thing for the Holy Spirit to bug us, to work in our conscience, to say, you ought to listen to that preacher, you ought to listen to that scripture, you ought to follow what that scripture says. That's a good thing. That's a good thing, and praise God for it. Satan cannot lay firm hold of the believer because he doesn't own the believer. He simply is fooling and messing with the believer, but God ultimately has jurisdiction, praise the Lord. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth 
in wickedness. And that's true. The whole world system does lie in wickedness. And for the Christian that's dabbling in sin, you're playing in a, a very dangerous area right now because it may be the conclusion of your own life. If you go back into sin and you fool with it and mess with it and you return to it, God's going to take you home if you belong to Him. If you do not belong to Him and you're fooling with it and you're going deeper and deeper, then you have a bigger problem and that is that you are endangering yourself in the physical consequences of your sin and you're not even saved. You're on your way to a devil's hell. We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding, a spiritual insight. We have a special perception. And that's been given to us through the Word of God. We read again in John chapter 16, beginning at verse number 7, down through verse 13, that He guides us in, into all truth. The Word of God is truth. Jesus said so as he prayed that great high priestly prayer to the Father. In John chapter 17 and verse 17, he said, Sanctify them with thy truth, thy word is truth. And so the word of God gives us special insight. We know things that others do not. The Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. Not only do we know what is true, we know who is true. And that is, there is that verification that uh, Jesus Christ Himself is the way, the truth, and the light. He is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Here we have the deity of Jesus Christ once again reaffirmed, praise the Lord. After interceding for backsliders, as we've seen in verses 14 and 15, the fallen is in danger of death. We look at the destruction of sin. Individually, it destroys. It destroys families. It destroys uh, governments. It destroys society. It's being played out on the micro and the macro levels. We see it all around us. If you Take the time. If you're bothered to listen to the news, you see how sin affects the whole world. And if you're dealing with people in any relationship at all, you see how sin affects relationships, how it affects families, individuals, how it clouds their thinking and keeps them from making wise choices. What is sin? It is designed to break down the individual and to... to uh, separate the individual from God's perfect will and rewards for being in His perfect will. The individual who establishes a pattern of right living goes back into sin, is going to be withdrawn, is going to be taken out of that situation. But praise God, we're already on the winning side. Jesus Christ has won the battle for us. And because of that, we claim the victory through Him over the world, over the flesh, over the devil. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Jesus Christ is greater than all our sin. And thank God for Him tonight. You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before He voluntarily gave His life. He died on the cross, He was buried, He rose from the dead, and He's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of His blood and through His victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. 
The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask Him to save you? Something like this. Dear God, just pray, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.